presentation. Uh, so before I start, I just uh, uh, wanted to talk to you about what this presentation is about and uh, give an introduction to my presentation and what we are going to cover in this presentation. Um, as you all know, uh, as Professor Burgess was saying that uh, electric vehicles and autonomous driving uh, is changing the whole automotive industry today. And as we speak about uh, autonomous driving, one of the key pillars in, as we march forward in this, in this area is safety. So safety goals, uh, are meaning safety of the passenger and vehicle. So the safety goals is considered driving a lot of system architecture moving forward in our industry. So this presentation is basically giving an introduction of how the safety goals are changing and how that is driving us to develop safety architecture in designing power electronics, motor drive, motor architecture. And, uh, and this, at the end of this presentation, also I'm trying to also give a few new vehicle architecture concepts uh, which are presently working in auto industry uh, for fulfilling the future needs of auto industry in regards to autonomous driving and uh, the safety uh, of in safety during autonomous driving. So that's the main part of my presentation here. So for I, I will start my presentation uh, by understanding what is changing in safety and how that has evolved in, in this all over these years. Apparently for last five, six years is where the major transition is happening. So what safety system means and how that is binded with this autonomous level concept. I, I think you guys will have all read about different level of autonomy. Uh, that means uh, some are semi-autonomous as we move forward in our industry, we are trying to achieve a full autonomous vehicle. So how, how safety and how that goals and how that autonomous level concept is merged in and is what I will be covering there. Then comes from there, we are going to drive, uh, talk, take a use case. And uh, I've been working uh, all my years in, in, in the area, in automotive, in the area of steering, brakes, and traction drive. So I'm going to take a case study example of steering and show you that how we are driving and what is, what, what is that safety goal and how we are changing our architecture and what type of different architectures are being done in production today, as well as going moving forward, what all different type of architecture is going to happen. So that will give us an understanding of how the safety from an overall systems goal and how that is bring, brought down to develop power electronics and motor uh, uh, design. So that's the idea of this presentation. So as you all know, uh, in, from an old, I'm, I'm going to keep this presentation uh, a little more, uh, less math because I want to make sure that I, I convey my concept properly. So it will be a more of uh, a presentation where I'm going to give a different architectures and different diagrams. And uh, at the end of it, if you guys have any questions, we can go in deep in any of these topics. So starting from safety uh, point of view is that, uh, as you all know, from where we started in 1952, what we have as a car today, you guys know there's a lot of safety uh, critical things we have added, like a lot of things have changed. Airbags, we have ABS, and a lot of things which are, which are helps us during an emergency and all that stuff. Moving forward from 2000 to next era, it's going to change a lot more in, in regards to what, what happens behind or what happens in each of these uh, steering uh, systems, like in steering versus in brakes, in all of these uh, uh, components in the vehicle. So what are safety critical systems and what is the definition of safety critical system? 
A safety critical system is a system whose failure or malfunction results in one of the possible outcomes, a death, a loss of severe damage to equipment and environmental harm. So that's what we call as safety critical system. So if you take an automotive in this, in automotive, in, in a vehicle, what are the safety uh, critical components? I think the major four are what we have written here is brakes. We have power steering, uh, traction drive when we move to electric vehicles and throttle control systems. These are considered uh, traditionally the safety critical components. And these components is where the major uh, architectural changes are happening. So, so, so we have, when we, when I talk about, when I talk about safety and the safety critical system on these systems, these systems has different operating conditions or operating uh, regimes, I would say, when you have a failure. I think uh, most of us would have experienced in the vehicle, like when of the, one of these things fails today, it is very, very simple for us, right? If you, if you break, uh, just taking an example of steering, if a steering, anything fails in steering, like sensor or anything fails, usually what we do till now in our industry is to shut off steering. That means the driver will now control the vehicle using manual steering. So that means there's no power assist from the motor. So that has been what we call as a fail safe system. That means the system goes into a safe state where they cannot operate. In any of the, most of the components we have today, this is where, this is what we have today in our vehicles. It's called fail safe. That means any failure will shut down the system. Now, moving forward as we, uh, today's recent vehicles, like in the last 10 years or so, there are systems, we are not going to shut off the systems for uh, every failure. Um, for an example, from a steering perspective, like if there is, we, we measure the temperature where we are working, and if a temperature kind of fails, we really need not shut off the system. We can still make it operate for a certain reduced state, I would say. And that's, uh, and, and it'll have, it won't have the full performance, but it won't be like a manual steering. It will still have some assist given by the motor, which is what we call as fail soft system. Now, fail safe and fail soft system are available today in vehicles. You, you can, most of the systems we have falls under this category. Safety critical goals are this. Basically steering brakes all follows this, this uh, two concept. Now, moving forward, as you all know, as we move to autonomous steering, shutting the system down or reducing the performance may not be a, may not be the condition where we want to be when we, especially when we are in autonomous steering. We don't want the system to fail. So moving forward, we will start to develop architectures or systems which will follow and which will fall under the last two uh, regimes, which is called fail operational, which means the system will continue to operate even if there is a failure, if there is a single failure. So fail operational, and fault tolerant system. That means a faulty behavior of one system does not lead to a catastrophic malfunction of the overall system. That means if you have a single failure in some part of the system, that doesn't keep on driving to other failures in other part of the system such that there's a bigger failure happening. So this is very critical. Uh, I know this concept looks very simple, but what it drives at at a lower level when we design the system is a huge change. So a failure, op a fail operational and fault tolerant system is what we are going to be driving our system design to work with. So uh, I, have, I, have a, I have a simple concept here. So today in our systems, we look at fail safe. If you have a single point failure, I'm going to talk about the single point failure and dual point failure in this presentation a lot. So a single point failure means any failure, any one failure in the system will completely uh, shut down our system. So for a steering case, if there is a sensor failure, we'll completely shut down the system. That was our safety uh, goal. That means we'll, that, was our, that was our safe state when we call as in EPS. 
while if you think about it if i if i shut down the system when you're driving autonomous car uh, it won't be good uh, you are not in control and the vehicle is also not in control so that won't be good mo moving forward right so this strategy doesn't satisfy the future needs of automotive now before i start on on how this is going how different types of safety and the safety concept uh, i want to have a slide of what is the different levels of autonomy which we have which we are driving towards to uh, i know this is a this topic is something which is still in in flux that means it's still changing but i think our industry is have consolidated on all these levels pretty much now there is a level 5 which is coming now but i won't talk about that right now but in major if you look at levels of autonomy that means different type of automation starting from level 0 is what we have we already have level 0 and level 1 level 2 is also there so level 0 is nothing but our old cars which we have where there's no steering and braking and throttle control like crash warning system if you are going to crash they might let you know you, there's no control there's no autonomy as such in that level one is what we call as function specific automation where we have certain functions which are some features which have automated uh, a very good example for this is abs uh, the automatic braking system which we have today so if you press your brakes today in most of the abs enabled vehicles you will suddenly see that it is not actually you are controlling during a safety case like when you are suddenly pressing the brakes when you're in a in a in a very tight corners or sudden accident when you're going to hit somebody it is actually the abs which is going to control the brakes such that it gives the minimum stopping distance so that kind of automation though the driver is in full in control a certain level of functional automation is present today so that is what we call as level one automation now that is a specific function like brakes by itself it is not a cross-functional automation now level two is what we call as combined functions that means couple of these two functions is going to talk to each other and make more uh, better uh, automation level that's what we call as uh, level two and a quick example for that is adaptive cruise so you guys know that cruise means today like when i when i go in a, a highway or something like that you can put the vehicle in cruise and it will follow it will follow a set speed now adaptive cruise is a little more than that where we are going to reduce the speed if there's a vehicle before us so it's you can think about you can already see that what happens now is we are having a cross functional we are going to brake we are going to throttle these two are going to integrate with each other to drive the system so that is now called as cross functional automation which is level two which is already there in a lot of vehicles uh, developed today now level three and level four is where the major work is happening today in industry it's not there in all the vehicles there are only few vehicles which have these features but i'm pretty sure moving forward in the next five six years we will have a lot of vehicle which will satisfy level three and in another I'm expecting in another eight and eight years or something, we'll have a lot of vehicles in level four automation. Now, what is level three? That is what we call as limited self-driving. That means the car can drive by itself in most of the cases. So it has an integration of braking and throttle and steering. So now steering also goes into the function. It can steer the vehicle too. Driving expected for occasional control so in this case driver is still we are expecting that the driver is still present needed so he is still holding expected to be driving for certain cases driver can give up the full control and monitoring to the vehicle in some of these cases especially when we are driving in highway and when there is when there is everything looks good like when there is no uh, big rain or something like that when the lanes can be detected all that stuff will the driver will be able to give up the control and the car can drive by itself so example of that feature when you look at new vehicles you will you will quickly see especially like vehicle like tesla and stuff like that you will see a feature called auto autopilot which is coming in a lot of new vehicles too so autopilot is an example of that kind of a system where the driver can let go of the uh, steering and whole vehicle controls he needs to be there for driving but he can let go in certain condition 
Level four is, is where a lot of people are working and trying to achieve by going through level three to reach level four because there's a lot of data needed to be collected in real time and all that stuff where we don't need the driver at all. That is what we are trying to achieve, which is called full self-driving automation. In this case, all the brakes, throttle, steering, driving, is everything is being integrated. Driving is not expected for control. You don't, the driver need not be there. Uh, the responsibility of safe driving and monitoring solely uh, relies in the vehicle. So the vehicle will take care of everything, the driving and safety, and make sure that it's monitored everything correctly. So moving forward, we'll have vehicles which can drive by itself. So you can quickly see that though it looks very cool uh, at the point of where we can the drive the vehicle by itself. There is a lot of things needs needs to be achieved when to achieve get there, and that's where the changes are happening, and that's what I'm majorly trying to cover in this presentation. Now, as the automation, there are different levels of automation. Such is the case of what is needed from a safety architecture point of view. The same way. As we, I, I, there is a relationship with as the autonomy increases, the safety has to increase. And that, this is what it is showing here. In the level zero or level one, you can quickly see that fall, fail safe system was good enough. Uh, we are okay because there was no level of autonomy. And fall tolerance system was okay for level one and level two. Uh, fall tolerant and fall, fail safe and uh, systems were good enough. Uh, fall tolerance is, I brought it before because. There are certain, certain operations right now for level one and level two, we need a fault tolerance system. Uh, make sure that there is no catastrophic, uh, one failure doesn't lead to other failures too. So, and moving forward, when we reach level three and level four, we are basically going towards fail operational system. That means a single failure cannot uh, take down any of our system. So that is where the design is going to come. That is where how we are going to design the power electronics, how we are going to design a motor, everything. It, it affects each and every part of the system. Now, if you are in, in, in the world of safety, you, you will quickly come to a term called fit. And it is very important to understand what, what type of architecture, before we design architecture or anything, we need to understand where is the major failures going to happen in our system. And what is the failure rate of these systems? Like some, some failures is, the, the happening of such failures is very low. Like if you consider a motor, a rotor breaking, a breaking of the rotor is the failure of that is, is very, very low. So, but if you take, a, in, in the same case, if you take a Paultronics and if you take a, an inverter or if you take a FET, you can quickly see that a breaking of fat or a sensor, uh, the failure rate is much higher than a rotor breaking. So we need to understand that very clearly when we design our system, because we need to understand where the areas of failures are and how we can uh, mitigate that failures. So that's what we are trying to understand. And for that, a, a, a term is called fit. A fit means what is the failure rate per billion hours is what we need to uh, rate each part of the system. So what is our safety goal? Is the major safety goals is identify where the fit rates are higher and those, those parts of the system where the fit rate is higher, the idea is to lower the fit rate with various design options, thereby increasing the availability of the system. That, that is what we are trying to achieve, right? We are going to identify where the major failures are going to happen and we will term it by a fit rate. We'll have a, we'll have a um, what do I say, a mathematical number for that. And we are going to lower that fit rate. Now, uh, I've, I've, I've just explained between a power electronics versus a mechanical failure. You can think about that mechanical failures like rotor braking and stuff like that is once you design correctly for the loads we are trying to achieve, the failure is much less compared to an electronics failure. And this example right now for a mechanical is showing an EPS system. I, I'll go about an EPS system quickly. So as the autonomy level increases, the idea is basically is to reduce this fit rate. So fit rates are in the numbers of 900. We want 
as the and on the x axis here is basically the autonomy level and the y axis here is basically the fit rate numbers so as we increase the autonomy level the fit rate number needs to come down so that that's the idea behind uh the the safety design now if you take if you take any system we can define the system in three different areas is is what we call as a mechanical area then there is a hardware uh, which we club sensors and all other uh, features we need for power and all that stuff we need for the hard which we club under hardware and something we call as power electronics which includes uh, motor drives and uh, controls and everything so these are the major areas we are going to look at uh in every system and how we are going to reduce different failures which falls under these category so and the or the down class hello is is there any question sorry i didn't get it okay i think i'll move on so mechanical if you if you think about mechanical failures uh is usually uh, like when you have uh, mechanical failures this is usually covered with design margins that's our goal like how do you reduce the fit rate of a mechanical failure basically uh, mechanical failures are covered by a good design and we have design margins and doing various dfmea on dfmea it's a concept which we call as design failure analysis uh, so we'll do major analysis and make sure that that the this failures cannot happen for that system for the prescribed loads it is going to see and we have various design margins so that even if there is a uh, unrelated failure it won't it's not going to break so that's what mechanical failures are usually done for lowering the fit rates because you cannot have uh, in in reality you cannot have two rotors and stuff like that to be designed it's going to increase the cost so if, if you if you if you think about it adding multiple redundancy or add uh, what i calls as adding lot of uh, safety architecture it's going to drive up the cost very soon very high right because you are going to add so many things in the system architecture in designing the system which will drive up the cost so as a designer i need to be make sure that i am not going to overdo it so that i keep the cost at the minimum but i can satisfy the safety that that is the work we are doing when we design a system we have to satisfy cost and we have to make sure that the but the system safety is not uh, uh the system safety goals are met also so let me in the instead of explaining generally how the system architecture is 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 done in to drive to how to polytronics architecture is done or motor architecture is done i, I would rather take an example and show you guys how that is done which will be easier to explain so here i'm going to take case study of an electric power steering and before i start anything about safety design and what is changing i would rather give an explanation of what eps is today uh, so that everybody uh, are who don't know about eps will also understand what eps does electric power steering is is uh, a system which is basically going to help the driver while turning the steering in in all of our vehicles until now in most of our old vehicles we used to have some level of assist it majorly came from hydraulics that means which we call as hydraulic steering the it was a mechanical assist which was given to the driver and that's what was helping us steer the system when you take an old car uh, old and time car versus the present car it was it's very easy to steer now and that's because of this hydraulic steering we have now last 10 years or last 15 years i would say all the vehicles especially now uh, with autonomous coming all the vehicles are moving to is moving hydraulic steering and moving to something called electric power steering where the hydraulics is been removed and we are now adding an electric motor to assist the driver and most i think 90% of the cars and uh, and uh, for any autonomy we are talking about we need electric power steering hydraulics cannot achieve that very well so 
moving forward, most of the cars will be now electric assist uh, power steer. So that's where electric power steering uh, is picking up a lot in the last 15 years. So basically what we do in electric power steering is basically we, in this diagram, you can see that number one, the driver is going to steer the vehicle. So we are going to measure how much force or how much torque is the driver is putting. So that's what we have something called torque sensor, which we have in this steering here, which measures how much torque is what the driver is assisting, is putting. This torque put by the driver is sent to our ECU. This is the electric power steering. This is a, there's a motor and there's a controller. So torque sensor, what, how much torque the driver is, uh, is putting is what goes into the electronics. Our ECU is what calculates the amount of assist. That means based on how much driver is putting, we are going to assist him using the motor. So basically that's what we call as power assist required for the driver uh, so that he can turn the vehicle. He's been calculated by this ECU and he's going to be commanded to the motor. So the, now the motor is going to give a torque. He's been commanded a torque. And basically the motor is also going to assist the driver in turning in in turning the wheels by, by add, adding the assist to the rack system. So this ra uh, reduction, there is a reduction gear here. So the motor torque goes through a mechanical reduction gear and basically that motor torque is then converted into this axle force, rack axle force, which has been applied to the wheels. So this is what happens in an EPS. So you can quickly see that there's a motor, there's a torque sensor, we also, for autonomous steering, we also have steering angle sensor to know where the angle is because the driver, we are actually going to command angle so that we can control the steering wheel. So that's what EPS is doing. So basically, it's going to look at the driver, how much force he's applying, we are going to assist it using the motor. Now, if you look at a steering system by itself in a, in a closer picture, you have basically torque and angle as an input. You basically then have a torque signal transmitted to ECU. ECU calculates the assist force based on the driver input and speed because based on the vehicle speed, the amount of force needed becomes is changing. Then ECU controls the required current from the board. So there is a motor controls here with, with a inverter and stuff like that in the board. It's going to control the current applied to the motor. Then the E-pass, which we call the motor rotates, which rotates the rack and pinion gear. This, this is the gear. Uh, you can see that the motor shaft is here and there's a gear mechanism here. And the, the ball screw transforms into the into rotation motion into a translation motion and which will assist the force of the, which will assist the force applied to the wheels. So that's what EPS does in a nutshell. So if you quickly look from a controls point of view, uh, uh, in a in a block diagram, it's a very simple. Uh, it's a very traditional uh, motor control system, where you can quickly think about as it's a torque control system. That means from a motor drive controls point of view, what we are doing from a motor controls point of view is that we receive a torque command based on the torque sensor. We know what how much torque to be applied to the motor, so we receive a torque control. The VDC is basically the battery voltage and we have the speed of the motor. We are now going to calculate something called the reference current. And we have a pure PI control. Uh, you guys would have learned any control system is that the current is being controlled in DQ coordinates. And basically we are going to apply the duty cycle and we are going to control this motor so that the current achieved is what we wanted for the current commander. And basically thereby achieving the torque requested by the driver to be assisted for. So basically it's a torque, open loop torque control system uh, where we get a torque and we are going to give, make sure the motor achieves the torque. So that's in a nutshell uh, what we do. So quickly you can see here from an architecture point of view in EPS, what kind of sensors we need also. And since EPS is an area where uh, we have to make sure the torque uh, produced is very clean. That means there's no ripple in the torque. Think about this way. If I have a torque, which is very, uh, in, 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 which creates a lot of torque ripple, it is going to be felt by the driver because the driver is attached mechan physically, 
to the motor. So the torque ripple, which is felt, which is developed by the motor, will be felt by the driver, and that is not considered a good system. You don't want driver to feel any ripple while uh, assisting the motor. So quickly, you can see that to to the requirement for torque ripple generated by the motor is very low here. So we are talking about meeting a target of like say 50 milli Newton meter of torque ripple. That means the developed torque by the motor should be less than 15 milli Newton meter torque ripple. That means we need a system which can control very well. Therefore, we need position sensor and for it's a it's basically a synchronous motor we use uh, PMSM or IPMSM motor is what we use for uh, for the EPS because of its efficiency and packaging size. So we quickly need a couple of sensors. We need position and we need current sensor because it's a current control system. So any failures in these things have to be mitigated because as I talked in, in, initially, any single point failure should not shut our system down. And you can quickly see that there is a three-phase inverter uh, devices also in this picture here. So if you look at, if you look at how different failures are, I've just plotted here different types of failures and the fit rates of that. In, 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 to give an idea, uh, to give an idea of where we lie and where, which are the major area we need to concentrate on uh, to reduce our fit rate. That, that's our goal right now, right? So we have to reduce, we have to identify where the failures is majorly going to happen and we are going to reduce that fit rate by different architectures. So that's a concept here. So if you look here, here, you can quickly see that sensor failures are very common. So their fit rates are very high. Uh, moving down power electronics failures, communication failures, because we communicate with the vehicle in CAN, uh, something like uh, a protocol vehicle uh, network, we uh, communicate through that. We have connectors for torque, power, those connector failures can happen. Then always there is a software failure, something like and the, our ECU can have failures. So that their fit rates is also high. So there's a, like anything can happen to ECU, some memory corruption or something like that. So that failures are high. Now on the lower trend of it, like mechanical failures are usually considered lower fit rate because of their design. Already they're mechanically designed for this with margin. So mechanical failures like rotor shaft breaking, or the belt skip. That means there's a belt mechanism to take the rotational torque of motor to translate it to a, a, an axle condition. So there's a belt mechanism, which I showed you before. So those belt skipping or I, the, when I talk about I shaft, the basically I shaft is breaking off this, this part here. And belt skipping is basically, this is the belt we are talking, where it is attached, it is attached to the motor shaft and it is attached to this ball screw mechanism. This belt skipping from there, those breakage is considered lower because it only happens if the loads are going to go outside our design margin. And those usually don't happen very easily. So those fit rates are very low. So by mechanical design and having a good design margin, we'll take care of those failures. But we need to now, so the, con, so the idea now is, if I clock these two, you can quickly see, how do I bring down these high rate failures? How do I bring those fit rate down? And that's what we are going to talk about today and how we are going to bring down these failure conditions. And what, what do I need to do in system designing uh, to bring down this fit rate? And that's what we are going to see today. Now, before I get into design, we can quickly learn about some things from aviation. That means something from aviation industry because usually if you look at automotive industry, we usually follow aviation industry behind. So, and, and autonomous is nothing but what is already there in today in our plane and aviation industry. Autopilot, the name of it itself comes from aviation. Basically today in, in our planes, we already have autopilot. So we are going to learn a lot of failure design concepts, which we have already understood in aviation. We can learn from there. So I've taken, in here, I've gone uh, from, from this regulation uh, article here, I have taken some key points which we use today in automotive industry as our, as our design uh, concepts and which will help us uh, designing our system. 
So I, I want to quickly run through these ones. Uh, so basically, any single point failure in the system during a flight should not prevent a continued safe flight or landing or reduce any capability of the system. This is one of our goals too in our automotive industry. It's similar just that instead of flight, now it becomes automotive. We cannot have any reduced performance for a single point failure. Using redundant or backup systems to enable continued function after any single failure, that means in, in the in aviation industry, like two or more engines or hydraulic systems or five flight control systems, you need to have something called redundant systems. We are quickly going to that kind of a system architecture where if one system fails, the other backup systems will take over. Isolation of the systems and components and elements such that failure of one does not cause the failure of other. And that's what we call isolation is termed as independence. So we need to have, we need to make sure our system is, the failure is independent. So that means it doesn't create any additional failures. And proven reliability of such that multiple independent failures are unlikely to occur during the same flight. That means a lot of different one per single point failures should not occur in, in the same, in one, uh, driving or one flight condition. So we need to make sure that our systems are reliable and we need to do a lot of testings for that and show our reliability of each part of the system. Failure or warning indication to provide detection. So quickly we need to give any failures in the system. We need to give warning and indication to the driver or, or uh, so that we can quickly take over the system or have some safe state uh, condition so that either in the automotive industry, either he can go and park it to the side of the road so that he doesn't have to drive it. And checkability, that means the capability to check the components detection. So we should make sure our component can detect the failures, different failures, and also make sure that detection is reliable. And design failure path to control and direct effect of the failure in a way to limit safety. That means if there is any failure, even if there's a multiple failures, you need to still make sure that during the design, the failure path, the driver can take a path where he can quickly reach to a safe state that means either to the side of the road and so that he's not left alone in the in the highway or he's he's not left in a condition where he cannot take control of the vehicle so that is very important too error tolerance that considered adverse effects of foreseeable errors during plane design test so we need to have a lot of tolerance in our error condition so we need to make sure that our design are robust and we have a good margin in even in our error failure tolerance condition when we design our each part of the system. Now, safety strategy ahead for automotive. So as I talked before earlier, a single point failure is going to shut down the system. That is not acceptable. Now, what we are going to in future is going to be a single point failure is not going to do any change to our system. A driver by itself would even know, he will just be, he'll be just warned that there is a system failure, but there'll be no performance difference. The system will work as it is. There's been no degradation of performance. Now, from a single point failure, if you have a dual point failure, now you get into a half system. That means you get into a system where an architecture where your full performance is not there, but system is still not complete shutdown yet. So, but it is a reduced performance mode. So that's what will happen with a dual failure. Now, a triple point failure is where I think we will completely shut down. I don't think we'll be able to design much more than that. But this is what is we are trying to achieve. So you can quickly quickly see that from where we were, we now need to go to a failure condition, which is called triple point failure, which can only which can only uh, go into a state of complete system shutdown. So we need to make the architecture follow this, and we need to make sure our design achieves this goal here. So that's what we need for level four autonomy. Now, what are different strategies to lower the fit rate? The most common employed in our industries are two. It's what we call as homogeneous redundancy. I think these terms are very important because this is what in, in our industry we all are working with. So uh, homogeneous in redundancy means a system where there are two identical calculation instances. So that means you have a system which is, have, and there's a two identical system running at the same time. So basically, if one fails, the other systems can take over. Uh, the advantage of that is reduced development effort, right? I, I just have to make two systems which is same as each other. So from a development point of view, it is very easy for us. It's the same software, same 
same MCU, same design, everything is same. Just that we are we are increasing the uh, number of parts. So, but the problem with the cons with such a redundancy concept is there are two. One is cost, which which comes later. But the other problem is there's something called systemic failure. That means if you if your design already has a systemic failure, both the design will fail at the same time. So having a duplicate of a system may not be a good thing sometimes because if you have a systemic failure, both the system will fail at the exact same condition. So that may not be a good uh, system also. Now that's the disadvantage of homogeneous redundancy. So there's something called diverse redundancy in which what we are doing is a system where there are two or more components which do the same or different calculation to achieve the equivalent functionality. That means when, when I say calculation in, in the sense of design also, is that in a diverse redundancy, it's two different systems it's, which will achieve the same goal, but it's not the same. In that way, the systemic failure won't happen. Now, now I'm going to talk about architectures now, how we are going to design uh, EPS and how what, what is happening in our, for an example case of EPS. So major sensors used, I'm going to give an example of how these are brought down, how these sensors, major sensors used for EPS drive system, as I talked before, are torque, motor position sensor, and current sensor. These are the major three sensors we are using for our system. Now, most of the sensor design concept, if you take sensor subsystem as such, the way we are going to achieve uh, safety is going to have redundancy in our sensor capability. That means having multiple redundant sensing capability is what we are going to have. This is a simple example. You can see here, like usually uh, our, there is a sense magnet. It, uh, it depends on Hall effect. There are different types of sensors. The, this one we are talking is primarily what we are using for like an EPS application where there is a sense magnet and the motor position sensor chip uh, is on top of that sense magnet. And the sense magnet is attached to the rotor shaft. So basically we are detecting the absolute position of the rotor for our controls. Basically now that sensor die will have two different dies. That means there'll be two different position signals, same position, but achieve two different ways. And we are going to sense that. So we'll have multiple redundancy in our position measurement. So you can think about some technology to give an example. The position one shown in this example is, is calculated using a GMR technology. And the other one is using a different technology uh, for sensing the same position. So you can quickly see that when we develop the sensor, motor position sensor, we are going to have chips which are able to sense position using two different technology inside the same chipset and giving us this position. So in case of one position failure, we have another position to go to. Now, does that achieve our safety goal? Maybe not. Dual redundancy does not offer complete redundancy since during a failure, think about the position case, right? During a failure condition, it is not possible to figure out which sensor failed. There's another problem now. Even if I have two sensors, it's not going to help me achieve the full goal which I'm trying to because I need something to detect which one failed also. Some failures, we are able to detect by the chips. Those, if we can detect it, we can go to the other sensor. But there are failures which in the sensors, which the chips cannot detect which one failed. So it doesn't come, give us complete strategy. So we need another voting strategy to figure out if a sensor failure happened, which, the, which one failed. And that's where we go into a triple redundancy case. Now, now comes the problem of cost versus how we design these things, right? So just increasing the number of sensors doesn't help us because yes, that achieves the redundancy concept, but it's going to drive up the cost. So how do I reduce the cost and keep the redundancy uh, which I need so that I can vote between these two systems? So basically, if you look at the position number three, what we need is something which can detect which one failed. And I quickly move on to one of my uh, research topic areas. That's why I want to bring this here is what, why sensorless motor drive controls is, is becoming a, is how we are going to achieve sensorless in, 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 our, in our application. I know there is a lot of application which use sensorless drive controls, which doesn't use position at all. But if you consider the case of EPS, sensorless motor drive controls is not achievable by itself in a, in a, in a sense because 
of the torque ripple requirements uh, to achieve, as I talked about, 50 millinewton meter. It is going to be very hard and with the present technology to apply sensorless techniques to achieve there. But sensorless techniques can be still used in our area in these conditions because we are going for triple redundancy in sensors. And sensorless can, uh, is, is a very good example for that where I can use the, the third sensor as a sensorless techniques. Basically sensorless means we are going to use other sensors which we have to detect this one. So a multiple failures, is not, is not, we can at least achieve a single point failure. We can achieve that. We can, we can detect which one failed, right? Using the other sensors. So sensorless techniques are very, is coming into reality for us. It's much useful. So we are going to use sensorless techniques to decide which one of these fail. Now, there are different sensorless techniques. I, this, this is a, I, I'm just going to brush through this slide here. And in case, uh, in EPS case, we are using the one which is highlighted in, in kind of in that PWM excitation area because of we want to keep the noise and NVH requirements down. So there are different types of sensorless which works at low speed, which works at zero to high speeds. We, and in EPS case, we want a sensorless techniques which works from zero till high speed. So it, it usually falls under, under the category of saliency and high frequency methods. And I'm not going to get into sensorless topics now. Now, effect of multiple redundancy. So you can quickly, this, this shows that the dependability rate versus the system redundancy. If you have a dual system with a triple system uh, redundancy, you can quickly see that the rate at which a first failure happens is going to be less. That means in, in the rate at which meaning that the first failure is uncovered, that means there's no, uh, there is no issue with the first failure comes down a lot and also with the second failure. So you can see that as the redundancy increases is the, the dependency of the first failure shutting down the system also reduces. Now comes, uh, now I move on to something called inverter and how do we, how do we bring down the inverter redundancy? How do we bring down the inverter failure condition? For inverter case, we are, having different methods, but usually it boils down to redundancy in inverters. That means the architecture is going to lead to something which we call as dual redundant system. That means we'll have two inverters, two ECUs, two power supplies, and we are going to convert. And there's an inverter switch basically at, as one of the architecture is where the power supply, one, the first one on the top, like power supply one, EC one inverter is going to drive the motor. And in case of an inverter failure, we are going to quickly switch to the other inverter. So basically this will take over. That means we are developing two uh, system which has redundancy and which can drive each part of the systems can drive the full motor capability. That means each one by itself can drive the full motor and it has no reduced performance. So you can see quickly see that if the inverter one failure happens, it quickly goes to the inverter two and it can work that way. So inverter redundancy, inverter one failures, supplies the full current. ECU has the logic to control the drive system and diagnose any fault on its sides. Inverter switch is only connected to the inverter one. That means this switch initially is only converted to inverter one during normal operation. During a failure condition, failure on inverter one causes the inverter switch connect to inverter two side. Therefore, inverter two is capable of providing full capability and therefore no degradation in performance. So that is one type of architecture where, where you have two systems which is capable of driving the full current. So you need to develop inverters which is capable of driving that, right? So you need to have that much capability in both the systems so that there is no uh, performance difference. What is the pros of this, this type of architecture? System is able to provide full performance even after failure. Both system one and system two can have similar application, thereby reducing the development effort. This is something called homogeneous. We can develop both the systems homogeneously so that the effort uh, for developing this kind of systems is less. Cons of that, both inverter and one inverter two should be sized for full, full current because it has to drive full current, thereby increasing the cost. Now, I cannot reduce the inverter size because it has to drive the full current. The two independent power supply needs to be designed so that it can supply full current. It's not only us, even the power supply, which is coming from the vehicle, has to be designed that carries the full current there. So the vehicle architecture also increases the cost. Now, 
is there a better architecture also there are different types of architectures which is popping up in in, in our industry right now all these are in and heavily researched right now and trying to understand which are better and which are uh, which are better for system as a whole as a vehicle architecture also so our suppliers are suppliers like us we are working with heavily with our uh, oems and trying to understand and design these concepts so this is just showing for redundant motor option so in case of motor failures right we talked about inverter failures we talked about sensor failures now what happens if a motor failure happens phase to phase shot or something in there how do we have redundant options a single so the major ones which are we are actively working are these ones are called single motor with more than one winding set so now we are coming into motor architecture so we'll have two winding set inside the motor so that they are independent so that we can control them so in any one winding failure doesn't take the system down so they are two independent winders. so single motor with two winding set or we can have dual motor actuation that means we have two different motor each designed for 50 percent in normal case and which we can achieve with two different motor set but there's mechanical uh, actuation which we had to integrate two motor set and the other one is what it's very interesting and people are trying to achieve that because as a system if you look at it designing an independent actuation that means if you really have a system actuation which is right on the wheels it is an independent with each other so that we can we have four system on the wheels to drive the vehicle that independent actuation system are are very good for system this is it is not really steering now it's more into traction or driving the vehicle also so this concept of independent actuation is also heavily considered in both steering and traction drive so these concepts are not just for steering this is the same thing which does for traction which we are trying to apply also now let's let me bring about what happens in in, in an architecture i talked about this kind of an architecture where we have full redundancy but that drives up the cost and we might not some oems doesn't want that kind of cost increase so another system architecture is where i was just talking about where a motor will have two winding set so if you look at it in a normal operation there, i'm just drawing a different concept block diagram there's a torque loop motor control we have pi control to control current duty cycle we have two sets of inverter we have two sets of current sensor we have position each set by itself will only provide 50 percent of the torque demand so as a system as a whole this motor will be providing the total 100 percent torque needed or current need, uh, need to be achieved but each side of it is going to only provide 50 percent in a normal working operation now if an inverter failure happens in such kind of a system what happens is basically we can still shut down this half of the system but that doesn't mean the complete system is shut down yet we still provide up to 50 percent from the other side of it that means from a vehicle steering point of view a single point failure is not is not going to achieve full performance though but we are a little below that we can still a single point failure is not going to completely shut down the system but going to a reduced performance mode which is where we are right now we are trying to evolve to the triple redundancy so up to so basically this system architecture will provide any any major failures like inverter or current sensor we will go to a 50 percent assist mode so uh, single motor with multiple failures the pros are the when the winding shot or inverter shot happens so now with with a redundant motor option even motor failures can be uh, mitigated now with the winding shot or because in the in the previous architecture when i talked about motor is single though so winding shot is still a problem so we cannot achieve that redundancy there while in here in this architecture when we are 50 percent since we have two winding set when winding of a shot or inverter shot happens in one winding set the other winding set can still provide torque to actuate the system the torque produced during one winding shot is proportional to the number of winding set available so whether we need two winding set to three winding set for example if you have motor with two winding set upon a failure you can provide max up to 50 percent torque well you can increase the winding set if you have three winding set if one winding fail we can still provide up to 75 percent now each one is providing uh, so you'll have more available torque even during a single failure the inverter needs to be designed only for 50 percent max torque so you can quickly see that the inverter cost actually reduces because each inverter is only providing 50 percent of that current it needs to be designed for that cons 
Cons for this is that we won't get full redundancy on a single failure. That means performance will be 50%. That's not a failure does not provide uh, up to 50%, especially like failure, like phase shock. Sometimes what happens is in, in, in like motor phase shock, we cannot get 50% all the time. So some failures cannot provide 50%. Need to have two independent inverters controlling the motor at all times. So we need to drive both the inverters for normal operation. So that increases the reliability of this thing. So that's a con for it. Dual actuation system is the case where two actuation systems are designed in the architecture. Each actuation is designed for 50%. Now, instead of two winding set, we have two motors now. In normal working condition, both system is designed to meet 50% system output. In case of failure one in system one, system two shall provide 50%. Now, in this case, it's completely independent. So a winding failure in one doesn't mean we can still provide 50% because more than because the other motor can completely provide 50%. The system one and system two, different system providing similar functionality. And this can achieve what I call as heterogeneous. That means you can develop two systems with two different softwares and we can completely achieve, even a systemic failure won't happen here because we have two issues. We can develop systems with two different architectures. The develop ta development time is more, but systemic failures is reduced in this type of architecture. Moving on, this is where, when we go into moving on to traction drive, independent actuation system, in such architecture, the actuation system is placed near the load demand because where we really want to assist is the, is the load of the tires. We need to move the wheels, right? So in the traction drive. So the, the actuation system, the motor is right where the, the load is demanded, the demand for the load is. Thereby reducing this whole efficiency, we have a lot of reduction gears and stuff like that. We can reduce all that stuff. Mechanical gear reduction is reduced. It provides heterogeneous uh, capability. Heterogeneous means you have two different systems which is totally independent, developed not similar way. So systemic failures is not there. The provide, this provides systems with more than dual redundancy, thereby helping lower the fill rate. So it provides system with more dual redundancy because you can keep, you have four wheels, you can have four systems. So you can have triple failures and still the system will work, right? Dual failures will make system will still work. The required system output per each system is much smaller because each system is only driving one wheel. Uh, if you take it from a traction drive today, it is trying to drive the whole four cars and four wheels, right? So the demand for the torque and the torque speed is less. So system output torque for each subsystem is smaller. System failure resulting in complete loss of redundancy is less in such system architecture. So you can quickly see that independent, independent actuation system is very good as a system architecture and safety point of view. But and uh, we have to understand cost and stuff like that. So that, th this is the area which is keenly worked right now in our industry. And that's where in-wheel motors, you guys would have heard that, in-wheel motors is picking up right now. So uh, where redundancy for traction drive system. So that means we really don't have a big traction motor anymore. We have in-wheel motors. So the motors are inside the wheels, which will be driving the system. Pros of it, independent actuation at each wheel no transmission or gear needed, which is a huge cost, cost reduction, extra space for better vehicle design. So you can see this quickly, there's no transmission here. And you can design this vehicle much better now. Ability to control each wheel independently, thereby giving a better ride and handling. Think about it, if I can control each wheel, I can do a lot more in safety point of view and how to control the vehicle. You can turn, eventually if you look at it, you can have a full turning of the wheel in one axis, right? You, because we have independent actuation, you can take a 360 degree turn of a wheel uh, in, 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 the, in a single point. So those are cool uh, features we can have when we have independent actuation. Cons, and the problem with these are we are going to add mass to this, this un, what we call as unsprung mass, which affects when we go through potholes and so, like what happens is ride and handling is when you increase the weight, you can quickly see that we are adding weight to the uh, to the system. Uh, so the tires are going to go up and down. So the unsprung mass, the weight is going to act and that, that creates a ride and handling problem, but we can mitigate that. There are, there are things for that. Should be able to, but that's a problem right now, which we need to address. Should be able to, should be durable since the motor right inside the wheels. So earlier the motor was in a better, better environment. Now the motor is going into a worse environment. So should be able to handle that. In case of event where one system fails, system should not cause a 
create a symmetry condition so that the vehicle is not pulled to one side. So if one, one system fails, you don't want the system to be pulling to one side of it. So we don't want to do that. So we need to mitigate those kind of conditions. Now we finished sensors, we finished inverter, we finished motor, we, we came to uh, different define. Now the other one of them was MCU. MCU is the issue which we work in, in to control the motor drive. That can have failures too, which is very high to fit rate. Where what we are doing now is there are dual core systems where we have two cores which are driving the, uh, the system. So uh, dual core inside one common die, or we can have dual core which are not in one common die, but we are having two separate chips which communicates through either through spice for an example. So basically here, the power supply is different. Regulators are different. We have two different calculation happening. So if one core fails, we can quickly go to the second core. Or in the other case, in here, we can basically use a supervisory core versus a, a lesser option uh, core, 32 versus 16 bit. We can, we can still have uh, reduced performance kind of a thing. Now, fail, future safety architectures is, will be definitely using, I think already our industry, even for steering, we are going already to multiple core system. So uh, multiple core technology, like making parallel computing and all that stuff is key now. So we will have uh, different multi-core ECUs moving forward. So we need watchdog. Watchdog is something in a concept where watchdog is a mechanism to make sure our ECU is working. So we will have different watchdogs uh, independent for each course. And then there will be a, a consolidated safety management unit I'm just throwing inside a chip design, okay? So uh, there is a different course. They have different watchdog mechanism, and then they have safety management unit, which will detect any of these failures happen. So watchdog is a mechanism which is used to make sure CPUs are active and working. There's no timer failures and stuff like that. And not only internal watchdog, we are already having an external watchdog so that any systemic failure is also covered by making sure externally these CPUs or cores are working too. So how to choose the right architecture? What is the best way? There are different types of it and how do I choose? So uh, eventually I want to bring down uh, the point that redundancy of components meets fail operational requirement. I agree that we can increase, we can have more redundancy in everything, but at the same time, the cost of the system will increase. The amount of redundancy added needs to be decided based on the required performance during failure. So you need to understand what is our failure? If that failure, what is our required performance need to be? And the safety goal for the system. Like today, the system is not asking for a triple redundancy or something like that. Today, system is only asking for a single redundancy failure. It should not uh, shut down the system. So we need not have, based on that, we need to design the system. As we evolve, we have to evolve the, uh, the safety concept too. The redundant architecture chosen, choose whatever the architecture we are, uh, uh, we are uh, going to uh, uh, do should meet the safety requirement uh, developed for the system. So it comes from safety now. So the way you can think about how safety is now driving all these things. In case of sensor redundancy, it is important to use techniques like sensorless estimation as to provide extra diagnostic capability with no addition cost. This is where we need to think out of the box to achieve different concept we need to bring so that we are not increasing the cost, but we are achieving safety uh, and safety reliability or availability of the system. In case of motor design, the design needs to be chosen such that the system will provide adequate output even under the failure condition and thereby meet the system performance. Everybody is not asking, uh, everybody is not asking for full 100% during a failure. They might be okay with 50% assist or when the failure happens. So we have to design choose the system accordingly. It should be noted that common cause system failure, which remove complete redundancy, needs to be carefully analyzed. Any architecture, we need to understand what are our common failures which can happen and that should be mitigated somehow. So even in the initial one I talked about, full redundancy of two ECU, two inverters, full capability, there are common failures and we should mitigate those things. In general, a heterogeneous redundancy is better for systemic failure, as I talked about. If you can develop instead of identical systems, but two systems which will achieve the same functionality, they are better. But this adds development time. So we need to be careful of how, when we talk with customers or when we, when we develop system, we need to understand what's the development time and what we can achieve in reality for these systems. 
Now, failure mitigation. Any, any, now we are going to talk about how we are going to mitigate failures before we enter, before we enter into a failure condition, before the failure happens, how do we mitigate? So autonomic uh, emergency, so there are a lot of controls, a lot of things we do in vehicle today to get there. So basically, as we talk about, you can quickly see that we have automatic emergency braking system. That's where ABS started. Now we have backup cameras and systems, which are very good for safety. It's very useful. We have forward collision warning systems. Like before you go into uh, an accident or you're going to hit something, it gives you a warning, but it's still the driver has to do it uh, to get out of it. Lane departure warning. So if you are, if you are moving out of the lane, it will warn you. In those things, you are still, the driver is warned and the driver has to take action. So think about this way and lane keeping. So that means even if now we are going to the last two, we are going where the driver is not actually doing it. The, 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 the system or the computer or the vehicle is going to do it. Lane keeping. That means even if the driver moves out of the lane, the, the vehicle will pull you back to the lane. That's what, what we call as lane keeping. Now, now driver is less, even though driver is not doing it, the vehicle will mitigate the failure, right? So those, now as we move forward, we are slowly trying, as we evolve, we are slowly trying to take care of failures which human does. And by mitigating that, we are actually making the computer or the, the, the system in the vehicle take care of mitigating such failures. And autopilot, usually if you look at failures, autopilot is a very good thing to mitigate failures because most of the accidents which happens in our, in our vehicles are usually, if you look at human errors, the percentage of that is very high. It's usually uh, human, uh, human errors or human, what do I call human uh, um, negligence is what cause uh, accidents. Autopilot will completely solve those scenarios where the humans are not intervened in here. So the computer will make sure the system is safe. That's why going full autonomy is actually better in one sense that human errors reduce, thereby we are making a system which is more safe. So that is the idea of going autonomous and why that is very, very good for safety and making a better safe environment for all of us so that accidents are less. So as we keep going, we want even during a failure, these are mitigating the failures, right? Even during failures, if you really think about it, human reacting to a failure is very slow. We can do much more if human is not actually ready to mitigate the failure so that even when, when you're going to hit something, we are actually in a much safer way to hit that person. It, it, it safer way and the human is actually uh, is less severe. The impact on the human is much less severe. So we want to actually take the driver out of the system slowly, but, but we need to build up the confidence because we cannot just go and take. So we need to build up the confidence slowly with the user such that we can achieve such systems. So most effective mitigation is basically crash avoid. If you look at today's system, driver assist or crash avoidance system like before human actually human intervenes if you can actually intervene and make sure that the system doesn't get into the crash condition that is the best mitigation we can have so we want to make sure that we don't enter into a safety problem and we can mitigate that that's the best way that's why autopilot and autonomous steering is so useful going forward that's where a new type of technology, this is the end to, towards my end, end of my presentation, is that there's new type of architectures or new type of systems, especially for EPS and brakes, we are trying to achieve now, which is called drive-by-wire technology. Drive-by-wire technology replaces, in reality, the direct mechanical linkage between the driver and the various car elements with the electronics components. Basically, the driver is not is really not mechanically connected to the wheels. That's what we are calling as drive-by-wire. The electronics does most of the safety critical functionality in such architecture. Although mechanical systems are powerful, they become overly complex and inefficient and conducive to wear and tear. That is one problem with mechanical system. And also one, the point which I didn't write here is during a failure, it is human has to take care of it. The reaction time is much slower. If you really to cover it, if, if I can drive it with the motor and we can, we can assess the situation and make sure that we can take action, we can, uh, the technology by, uh, by developing assist steering with the motor, with power electronics, we can be at much faster time. 
advantages of drive by by elimination of mechanical part reduce the weight of the overall system now when i'm by this i'm actually eliminating mechanical parts right we don't have a real linkage between steering and the wheel so we can remove all the mechanical parts we have improves fuel efficiency because the weight total overall weight comes down more space for better available car design lowers the manufacturing cost because mechanical part parts are less steering response can easily be adjusted so i can do so many things for you even when you go through a pothole or when you have when you have bad roads you really don't feel in the steering wheel because i can simulate that and make sure make sure that we can give a smooth uh, performance for the driver to feel so he will not feel the road vibration and stuff like that that is one one use case so steering response can easily be adjusted reacts more quickly resulting in shorter stopping distance and time this is very important too and because human is not intervening here so what are the major drive by by system as of now there are different types majorly one for steering one for brakes and one for throttle it's called steer by wire brake by wire and throttle by wire what is steer by wire what are we going to do traditional eps i have shown before a steering system is there there is a mechanical linkage this is what we call a side shaft it is connected to this rack here which is assisted with the motor and basically this rack system is is what drives the wheels that's what the wheels are connected here this is what we do in traditional moving forward we are going to remove this linkage completely between the wheels and steering wheel and actually this rack eps so there is no uh, connection mechanical connection between there now we have two motors now one to assist one to give a performance feel to the driver the other one to actually drive the system so if you think about it in what happens in reality in controls wise we are going to the driver is going to turn the steering wheel we are going to measure the angle using the angle sensor here we are going to relay that information to this ecu here there are two ecu and two motors okay we are going to relay that ecu here and we basically going to make sure this motor turns this wheel to that angle and basically it relays back what the effort or what the rack force is so that the driver can feel that effort when he's turning the wheels so we are going to give back a rack force or torque so that the motor commanded here will actually resist the driver turning so that he feels as if he's going he's turning in the normal vehicle today that is achieved by the mechanical linkage so basically you can see that this now will be an angle control system while this will be a torque control system just like traditional eps but it will be acting against the driver to make him feel that he's turning this will turn the vehicle towards uh, what the driver is intending the vehicle to move so if a controls point of view i just brought it here uh, this diagram is much easier the upper motor which is connected to the steering wheel is a torque control system basically you can quickly see that this major function of this motor is to first detect the sensor uh, position uh, of the steering wheel it relays that information to the lower motor controller which is a position command it comes to then this controller and motor is in a position control system it is not a torque control system it basically commands this motor to turn to that position so that wheels turns to that position that's the idea here so basically it controls the position of the wheels it's a position control system it then relays back it has a force or a force sensor which relays back amount of force applied which relays back as a torque command to the system and we basically control this motor to resist the driver for the torque so basically the torque one is a, the top motor is a torque control system the bottom one is a position control system in steer by wire the road wheel actuator needs to be position control so you can quickly see that the one i talked before for eps was this half of it to that we got a torque command and we are applying the torque to achieve the torque which came from the driver directly now that torque command is going to come from a position control so we add this type of control to it now we get actually for that control we get an angle command we have that actual angle we have a pi pi control and pid control for taking that angle to velocity and then velocity back to torque command and this part remains the same so from this part we are applying the torque to the motor and that motor is achieving the torque but we are actually controlling this whole thing from a position point of view and the position response we are talking now is between 30 to 60 millisecond it has to be that quick so that the driver when he turns the wheel turns that fast too so the driver doesn't know any he doesn't feel any lag or something like that when he turning the wheel now same thing is true for brakes too brakes also wants to go to electric brakes that means 
It's truly from a hydraulic braking system, which we had. It's the same evolution which we have in steering is what's happening in brakes. We moved from an hydraulic, we are trying to move towards an electrical braking system and true steer, brake by wire technology. That means mixture of what we call as electric braking system, where motor is actually braking the braking, doing the actual work of braking. And the, then the driver pushes the brakes. He's not really connected to the brakes, but we sense the amount of pressure or the force he wants to apply to the brakes. And we sense that and we truly apply that force through the electric braking. So we can do that of control. In that way, what happens is quickly you can see that now I have the control of steering and brakes. During a failure condition, I can activate these things much faster. So brake by wire, you can quickly see now, earlier we had a mechanical pads and which was directly connected using hydraulics. Now we have a motor which will be connected to the brake pads and we are applying the brakes using the motor technology, just like steering is. Brake by wire, you can, you can look at actuator now that we have a motor and a sensor right and phase converter right at the wheels for braking on all four wheels. We'll have a major ECU which is going to communicate what force needs to be applied on all these things by which truly senses this, this brake ECU is what truly senses what the mode, what the driver is applying as brake. And the brake applied, the driver, the feedback to the driver is also given by a motor. So we can actually mitigate what he feels. Today, if you look at ABS, when ABS gets activated, you can quickly hear the sound of the brakes coming back and forth. The pedal is actuating back and forth. That we can, we can simulate whatever we want. We don't have to simulate that also. So a brake by wire ar architecture gives us uh, that kind of flexibility. Advantages, the main advantages of, of brake by wire is the stopping distance. We can actually reduce how the stopping distance. That means once you apply, how fast we can reduce the stopping distance, thereby we, are, we are have much braking capability. So up to 30% can be purely achieved by electric braking. And, and uh, desirable pedal feedbacks in hydraulics case can be replaced by better feedback mechanism to the driver. So the driver doesn't feel that, that vibrations and stuff like that. Reduce the brake pack where, because we don't want to simply keep on applying the brakes and reduce it. We, uh, we can reduce how much force has been applied. So we can control how much the pad wear happens, thereby increasing the life of the brake, brake pads. Better control of all the brakes with respect to driver's intention can be given. Driving comfort can be increased by a lower required pedal force. So the driver doesn't have to slam on the brakes to apply the full force. So the pedal force he needs to apply to achieve uh, the pedal, uh, the, the braking force can be tuned now. So it's easier for the drivers, like when you have different types of drivers, some likes to apply hard brakes, some likes doesn't like that. You can actually uh, reduce that and tune that feature. But I'm talking about good things which is happening. There are a lot of uh, challenges there. Need high redundancy systems to make sure upon a failure system shall be capable to perform. So this is driving, there's already safety architecture. So this is driving, this needs to have high capability. So what all I talked about, like redundancy, all that has to come here. This requires high foreign communication hardware because now we are communicating this thing. So even if the communication failure happens, we should have redundant there. So there needs a high foreign all tolerant communication hardware, key redundancy for most sensors and actuators, high speed fail tolerant communication hardware between ECUs. So we need to make sure that communication never fails and we have high reliability there. So we need to make sure of that. It also drives from a, from a chipset's point of view to high voltage systems. Because think about it, if I can make the system, today traditionally EPS and all is a low voltage system in the, in the car in 12 volts. As we go to traction drive, we are, we are, we are coming up with voltages which are which are already available high voltage system i would rather use the high voltage because it is better for my uh, system efficiency point of view we can if i can drive the system at a higher voltage because i don't have to reduce this voltage you need to have a separate battery and stuff like that so this drives the high voltage systems so we need to develop chipsets for that high redundancy in sensors and not only on sensors sensing but on the power strip and microcontroller High redundancy in requirements for higher end, higher end MCUs are needed for applications. So the MCU design and MCU uh, architecture needs to be higher uh, redundancy. Software needs to have more power to execute new safety functions. So we have to have better better systems okay, and high degree of availability. I I degree of, yeah I'm almost done here. High oh, degree okay. of availability of okay. complete system is required 
and there is no mechanical feedback in drive by wire system. Yeah. Uh, uh, Dr. Damaskinen, uh, one minute. Is it possible we can finish it under two, three minutes because it's 30 we have another. Yeah, I'm done. I'm, I'm, yeah. This is my last slide. So I'm done. Okay, fine, fine. Okay, yeah, yeah. So software systemic failures is such as erroneous MCU behavior needs to be addressed, such as fault. We need to make sure the systemic failures are considered. So the conclusion is safety critical system in automotive needs to provide more availability to meet future safety requirement. Redundancy helps to bring down the fit rate and will be mostly used in architecture design going forward in all safety critical. The amount of redundancy needs to be should be analyzed from safety goal system and performance required and performance required during a failure condition. Heterogeneous redundancy is, is better concept. Reducing the mechanical linkage and having actuate, actuation system right at the loads will increase the overall efficiency and will be more fault tolerant. So that's a better system. Redundancy should be given in places where the failure occurrence are higher, resulting in total system uh, degradation. For, for faults like rotor shaft breaking need not be considered as the occurrence of such faults are very low due to efficient design margin and DFMEA. Adding redundancy means more computational power processor is needed. The development of such MCU should take into consideration reducing systemic failure. System architecture will always shall always provide a safe state in the event of unseen failures also happens. So I think that's the end of my presentation. And I think I've covered different architectures. I know there's a lot in one hour or one and a half. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, yeah. Okay. So,